I've been doing field work in Minsk and Bishkek, and um, when I would talk to the locals, and I would ask them, well, so was the Soviet Union empire an empire? Sure it was. Okay, so does it mean that uh, Belarus or um, Kyrgyzstan was a colony? Of course not. New forms. Where are they? New forms. <laughs> Hello everyone. Welcome to the first episode of Skull Scholarly Zeitgeist, the video podcast of the Harriman Institute at Columbia University. Our show is ho hosted by the literary uh, and cultural critic Marty Pavetsky, professor of Slavic languages at Columbia, and Tanya Fremo, Mellon Teaching Fellow at Harriman Institute. Here at Scholarly Zeitgeist, we will be thinking about the spirit of the contemporary moment together with our invited guests leading scholars and thinkers in the Slavic field. And today, we're excited to have with us uh, Sergei Ushakin, Professor of Anthropology and Slavic Languages and Literatures at Princeton, Associate Editor of the Russian Review, the author of books and edited volumes on Soviet avant-garde and media, media culture, post-Soviet trauma, nostalgia, gender, and nationhood. Welcome, Sergei, and thanks for joining us. Thank you, and thank you for the invitation. Looking forward to your questions. All right, you will have them. Uh, so, uh, Sergey, th thank you for coming, uh, and thank you for opening this series for us. Uh, and uh, the first question is actually what uh, inspired us for this, for this series in general, and I'm sure that you had this question before many times already. So, in this uh, horrible situation of Russia's invasion of Ukraine and and the complete sort of change. Uh, of what we thought about Russia for, for the last 30 years, if not more. Um, Slavic studies as a discipline to which we all belong uh, faces a very challenging set of problems, right? And uh, a very challenging need to transform itself. And um, many people are speaking about the decolonization of Slavic studies. Uh, so first of all, do you agree that decolonization of Slavic studies is uh, the urgent need for the moment? And if yes, how do you see this process? What, what has to be done first? Let's put it this way. Mm. I agree with the general um, idea that we need to broaden and deepen, I guess, the scope of the Slavic studies. But um, I think the, the main question is how to do it, how to go about it. With decolonization, I often feel that we are doing um, a thing that is similar to what the Bolsheviks did with Marxism. Is the country ready for Marxism? Not really, but we will do it anyway, right? So, uh, so decolonization, if you look historically, decolonization is a set of ideas and approaches and um, um, methods of um, uh, reading and uh, cultural practices came um, after sort of a very deep and long um, um, engagement with uh, postcolonial theory and postcolonial studies, mm -hmm. right? So in order to decolonize, you need to figure out like, sort of what actually the colony was, what the status of it was, or like what kind of what what kind of colony it was, and so on and so forth. Do we have this? Understanding? Do we have this kind of clear picture mm -hmm. when it comes to Slavic studies? I don't think so, because postcolonial studies have not been a part of the um, um, general kind of agenda of Slavic studies. We still don't. I'll give you one example. I've been doing field work in Minsk and Bishkek, and um, when I would talk to the locals, I would ask them, well, okay, so because I was interested very much in um, thinking about these um, um, countries as postcolonial ones, um, and I would ask them, well, so was the Soviet Union empire an empire? Sure it was. Okay, so does it mean that uh, Belarus or uh, Kyrgyzstan was a colony? Of course not. So help me out how to navigate on this gap between sort of having an empire and not having sort of clearly recognized or um, 
and just to know self-conscious colonies, right? So and I think that's the problem that we have, right? So the problem with decolonization is not just kind of like to, it's like, it's like with um, deconstruction. In other words, like the idea is not to break it uh, down, right? The idea is to recompose it in a productive way. And there are different ways to do it. So like, as I said, like we need to uh, be more clear and uh, we need to ask probably more precise questions about the nature of the Russian Empire, about the nature of the Soviet Empire, so how it managed kind of, to organize space, people, and I don't know, um, 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 economies and cultural production in um, in these um, uh, republics, uh, in order sort of to see what the decolonizing, decolonizing moment, the moment of decolonization, could add to this, right? So because if you look again um, at the uh, emergence of decolonial studies, often mostly from Latin America, often they imply that actually we can go back. There is kind of this um, the fantasy of um, the possibility of retrieval, we could bo go back to the pre-colonial time mm -hmm. and to rely and to reconfigure the current sort of uh, cultural identities, practices, production, or not, um, on the basis that has not been tainted by the colonial or imperial presence. As an anthropologist, I have a difficult time understanding how we could possibly do this <laughs> with, say, the Eurasian space, Eastern European space, right? So. Many, uh, especially Eastern European countries, that tried to do that, sort of to pretend that the Soviet period did not exist or the socialist period did not exist, and therefore we could sort of um, unproblematically go back to what what existed, say, I don't know, before the Second World War or even earlier. I just don't think it, it's productive. But having said all that, I do think that uh, there is a clear need to diversify. Slavic studies. We cannot focus only and exclusively on Russian culture, or even more so, like certain Russian culture produced in Moscow and Saint Petersburg. Right. So, Russia is a huge place, right? And Slavic studies is a huge field. So, mm -hmm. um, encouraging dialogues um, between different Slavic um, um, cultures and within certain Slavic field, I think there is one way to go. Problematizing more clearly the relationships between Slavic and non-Slavic and yet Eurasian cultures and literatures and sort of um, um, identities would be another one. So what does it, what, so how productive, say, it is kind of to think about, I don't know, the Kazakh and uh, the, um, uh, the Saha sort of cultures together, right? So what, what does the Slavic component add to our understanding of the Saha culture in that respect? And so on and so forth, like sort of like through all kinds of sort of, you know, lateral dialogues that could be happening and which are not happening, right? And I think in that sense, like, yeah, uh, do, do you think uh, there needs to be more ethnographic work before we kind of uh, reach uh, some particular theoretical instruments that can illuminate uh, to us the connection between postcoloniality and the post-Soviet world? Yeah, I'm an anthropologist, so like for us, like there is uh, no such a thing as too much ethnography. Um, but, but um, you know. Being practical, um, I had several students who couldn't do any ethnographic work first in in, in, in Eurasia, first bef because of the COVID <coughs> and now because of the war, right? So they just can go there. So and I think like the situation is going to last for quite some time, um, which is not to say that we cannot work with primary sources, primary documents. So like digital ethnography and that sort of stuff like could be happening, right? Um, more and more things, um, publications, historical publications become available on the web. And so I think engaging with them directly would be great. Like, for instance, like during this pandemic, I discovered uh, almost the whole set of Revolution uh, Vostok, the journal that was coming out like in the, in the 20s and 30s, is available. We know next to nothing about it. And that's digitally, right. And that's the source, that's the magazine, the journal and that basically try to articulate what could be seen as a prequel to um, post-colonial and decolonial studies, right? So on a completely different material f through a very kind of different uh, lens, like so it's very much sort of Marxist, it's not deconstructivist or you know, quasi-romantic, so, but it's still very useful. And we can sort of work with this, kind of bring this um, um, legacy into dialogue with the contemporary post-colonial and decolonial studies. Yeah, that, that, that's a great idea. and. But you're talking basically, and I completely agree with you that these things has to be done, have to be done. Um, the the transformation of scholarship, right? Um, but but it, it, we see here something like like catch twenty two, because okay, we, we transform the scholarship. Let's imagine that there will be more dissertations on decolonization, on on, on postcolonial methodology, on non-Russian subjects within within Eurasian space, uh, but. Who will hire these people? 
right? Uh, uh, in order to hire them, it's, uh, it's necessary to transform the entire, the entire curriculum. Who will transform this curriculum? People like those whom we will prepare. So, so that's right. I think this is a major question. I think it's kind of the institutional one, namely, um, okay, so if we look at other so-called area studies departments, say, I don't know, German or French or um, uh, what, what else would it be? It looks like in Spanish, uh, right? They're all centered around um, literatures produced in a particular language, right? So language is still sort of the core. Whatever we think about it, it doesn't really matter, but sort of language is still something that determines the quality and the direction, rather, of the department, right? So with uh, Slavic departments, it used to be this way, right? So Slavic uh, languages um, constitute or determined the scope of uh, cultures that you would be dealing with. Once we add sort of the post-Cold War uh, moment, suddenly that starts fading away. So we get Central Asian countries, we get the Caucasus, right? So we get um, ethnic groups, non-Slavic non, non groups within Eurasia, and that dilutes it, right? And it brings sort of a, um, a, um, a, a basic question, namely, should the Slavic studies as, as departments and uh, as a field follow the linguistic orientation as the constitutive um, element or the Cold War legacy through which these departments were constructed because, because basically they were, they were the departments of communist or anti-communist studies, like sort of <laughs> depending on what, where you stand, right? So, or Soviet studies, right? So like the logic was not entirely pure linguistic. It was very much sort of political, right? So we, but when we expanded, when we sort of trying to conform, uh, con uh, convert um, um, Slavic studies into kind of Eurasian studies broadly conceived, um, I have a real dif difficulty of understanding the institutional justification for departments conceived this way, right? So, okay, so do we want it to become sort of basically Department of Comparative Literatures and Cultures? And if that's the case, then sort of what prevents us from joining or doing this kind of work in the already existing departments of com comparative there literature? Are not so many. Right, yeah, but there are some, right? So, like, right? So, if we want to still capitalize, uh, capitalize on the um, uh, Cold War legacy, I find it politically problem <laughs> problematic. I don't necessarily see like why we need to perpetuate this kind of logic at finitum, right? So, but then to reduce it only to linguistic core, I then this also brings in that all kinds of other issues and other problems. So, how many lang how many Slavic language languages could you possibly teach? Productively, right? We know, like, when it comes to the graduate students, and we saw it actually with the complete um, um, uh, departments, right? Departments are reluctant to hire uh, an expert who works on multiple countries at once. Like, sort of this kind of knowledge becomes rather redundant, right? Or, uh, unless, well, it's kind of wrong way. Can you put it? Not redundant, but kind of not really. Um, Right. Useful, useful. Well, useful, yeah, for the departments, right? So because you still will be teaching, I don't know, um, um, your French literature, your um, Vietnamese literature, right, as opposed to, you know, Francophone Vietnamese literature. So like that's sort of kind of some rather niche sort of thing. So so in that sense, like I think like, we need to look at it as Slavists, and I don't have a clear answer, but like, sort of there is this, I, I think, a field-defining um, moment. My only kind of worry is that uh, given the interest of the administration, the university administrations, I'm just afraid that sort of, you know, the departments would be fold, folded um, into, you know, the already existing structures. And um, once we start sort of eliminating the institutional core I identity, identity, the institutional identity, 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 which is very conservative and associated with, with certain languages. Right, right but, but uh, as you know, uh, you mentioned that uh, departments of French or German uh, literature has, have undergone Similar transformations about 20 years ago, right? Uh, including okay, Francophone literature, still, yeah, German no, form yeah, literature, but, yeah, going beyond beyond right. the, 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 the imperial center. I, I have no problem with that. Like, sort of, like what you do is instead of studying, I don't know, Balzac, you study the Francophone literature. Yeah. I'm fine with that, right? But sort of when uh, you bring in, say, I don't know, just to give like an obvious example, um, like um, um, Kyrgyz uh, literature in Kyrgyz in the Slavic departments. So, Makes me wonder. So, look, is it the best place? It's probably not. But <laughs> but who else would teach it? Right, and where else? 
Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because the departments are structured, are they along the geographic lines or linguistic lines, mm -hmm. right? So Slavic studies in their current sort of transitional stage sort of tend to be structured by neither. Right, so the, you get like Stanford is a good example. You get Jewish studies, you get um, s some versions of Slavic studies and non-Slavic studies, right? So, so that, that geographical, why not? What was geography here? <laughs> well, well, what's not geography? <laughs> like, like the whole, <laughs> whole Eurasia, <laughs> from Liz Lisbon to Vladivostok. Exactly. Right. Right. Okay. It's not just a question of geography, I think. Um, I mean, sometimes it's, especially when we think about um, how this context is transforming um, Russia itself is also the question of class. Mm -hmm. And um, in your famous book, The uh, Patriotism of Despair, you uh, looked at veterans of Afghan and Chechen wars um, and explored the process of nation building and um, belonging in, uh, economically dis in the economically depressed context of the 1990s. Uh, the news that um, literally are uh, transforming the uh, current agenda is in Russia right now is that of mobilization, and we don't know yet how um, this mobilization will be put in, into effect, but what we know already is that so far the Russian uh, conscript army has been mostly drawing from the most impoverished regions like um, Buryatia and Tuba republics, and there's also some um, anti-war resistance and anti-colonial resistance there are uh, emerging uh, from the context of the uh, current war in Ukraine. So my question is um, whether this uh, new war um, is doing something new with the social landscape, or uh, do you see um, it as a continuation of the trends from the 1990s uh, in terms of class, do you think it's a, an entirely new um, post-Soviet story or it's, a, it's something that we've already seen and how it will affect our understanding of uh, loss, uh, trauma and nation in the current context? Right, I think it's yes and no. I mean, first of all, um, um, about the war in general, um, it's not just sort of Russian um, specificity where you get um, underprivileged um, and um, uh, marginalized groups who see uh, the kind of their participation um, in the military operations as a social you kind know, of uh, path out of um, their um, impoverished situation. The U.S. wars. I mean, who, who signs contracts? I mean, it's pretty much the same thing. So, in that sense, um, Russia has been doing sort of what pretty much any other kind of fighting. Um, militant kind of country would do. Um, what is different in this particular case, though, is something else, right? So we have, for the first time, an, an interesting addition, right? And it's uh, this um, Chechen battalion, battalion, oh, I don't know how you even, like, what the, what the term is uh, for um, this um, detachments, I guess. Squads. Squads, squads yeah. Um, squads. Yeah, so uh, that participate there, and they are Kind of ethnically colored, so to speak, right? So ethnically marked, so it's not your usual kind of, you know. Um, I mean, one one thing about the army usually is that in the war, like, sort of it kind of disintegrates, it erases um, ethnic differences precisely because you know everything is so much regimented. In this case, like, it's not quite it, right? So like we have very, um, you know, prominently um, um, marked um, ethnic um, um, uh, union unit. Uh, units rather um, that conduct this war, and I, I don't know what you think about it. Like partly, again, like it is, of course, like a legacy of the colonial war, or imperial war, rather. Uh, that, uh, and Russia, the empire with Russia, the division, that Russia, as you uh, remember, right? Yeah, that Russia had uh, in, in Chechnya, right? So, and this is sort of coming back, and it's come comes back in this particular form. Like, I it, it changes our understanding, so, you know, like of what the Chechen war was. Like, sort of, you know, it's kind of interesting. Um, uh, not feedback, but I'm, I'm, I'm how do you call it? Like, sort of like, um, a loop. But, uh, uh, Aaron called it colonial boomerang. Yeah, yeah. But but it's interesting. They they are very much on this side of the uh, of the uh, imperial sort of um, um, uh, operation, right? So in that sense, I I just don't know. I I I'm, I keep thinking about it, but sort of like I I don't have an answer. So clearly, right? Like the ethnic element 
comes in in this war, but and comes in in very very different ways, right? So like it's not one dimensional, but also it, it's also um, you know when I did the interviews with the participants on the Chechen war, and that that's when I started thinking about it in terms of class. Like most of them, most of the ones I've interviewed, they c did come from very sort of low um, economic background, um, uh, usually from villages where, and it was sort of the late nineties, uh, where no other economic possibilities or employment possibilities existed, right? But what was interesting, when I would ask them, like, whether, because it was when I was doing interview, uh, interviews, the Second Chechen War was going on, and I would ask them, like, if they would do it again, like, yeah, sure, and many did, right? It was even worse than that, like, or more interesting than that, like, sort of, um, I was there after 9-11, um, like, 2001, and so on. And uh, there was, for a very short period, there was this kind of discussion, but it was a very vibrant discussion whether the participants of the Afghan wars, like Soviet participants of the Afghan wars, could be employed by the U.S. Army because, like, they're already familiar with the terrain and every, everything. And it was interesting. So, like, people, yeah, sure, like, if I'm paid, look, like, I'll, I'll do it. So you, you get all that, too. And again, like, you need to think, like, sort of, like, what kind of skills you have to sell, what, uh, right? So, like, what are the um, skill sets that sort of you can market given the condition and like sort of it's basically you know your life uh, i just uh, read the dissertation by elena richina defendant at oxford mm -hmm. uh, who who refers to your book mm -hmm. quite often but but the dissertation is about the development of the veteran movement uh, since the afghanistan war and uh, until the present moment and uh, she basically shows that that was grassroots movement at first, right? And of course, uh, in the 90s, it was very much criminalized. Uh, and uh, in the beginning, it was very much sort of driven by the anger and trauma, uh, and uh, basically the the feeling of being Neglected. left left Neglected, behind. Yeah. No, no, no social support. Yeah. No, nothing. But in the course of the 2000s it became very much co-opted by the state and now it is the most uh, ardent supporters of the war uh, and basically this these veterans clubs of those who survived afghanistan and chechnya uh, they are main recruiters for the war and and uh, here here is an, an obvious proportion uh, that that we see everywhere sort of inverted proportion that uh, th th there is this expectation that if people feel themselves deprived, uh, humiliated, uh, economically and social, they will rebel. No, they will ask for symbolic compensation and the war and the idea of uh, imperial patri patriotism is the perfect uh, compensation for that and so that, that, that's what this movement demonstrates and that's what we see elsewhere. Right, but it, it, it's not just some kind of psychological Emotional. It's cultural. It's it's yeah, symbolic. but but I think it's more, there is more than that, right? So we are dealing uh, with a country where um, um, social contacts and distribution of resources um, are highly centralized, right? So it cannot really exist productively outside the state, right? So in that sense, like when you say that sort of it was um, the organizations were co-opted or um, kind of embraced or you know. Um, taken over by the state. Let's move to something hopeful, potentially. Sure. <laughs> hopeful. Let's try. I mean, there's not much hope, but there are uh, still made attempts of thinking about possibilities of finding a post-Soviet language that could be protesting the uh, contemporary official agenda um, and rhetoric of the war. My question about it is connected with the idea of recycling, cultural recycling and reshuffling. You've uh, written a lot on uh, different uh, versions of uh, reassembling, uh, excavation of nostalgic forms and shapes uh, in the search of uh, a post-Soviet expressive language. It's still the appeal of uh, the idea of rearranging, reshuffling, um, is still very much there. Um, just recently, uh, there was a video by um, the famous Russian rapper Ximiron that got really viral on YouTube, on the Russian YouTube, and uh, it's a uh, recurrent message there is a plea for a reassembling of the Russian culture. So my question is whether um, it is possible to um, activate reassembling as an idea for protest and whether reassembling can uh, potentially produce uh, a more optimistic vision of a post-Soviet future for us. Mm -hmm. 
You remember, well, you're, you're too young, but um, when I was at school, um, uh, secondary school, there was this basic rule that you learn in, in your um, math class at Peristanovki. Yes, slagaim, so many is many ads, which is to say, like, the sum uh, doesn't depend on the location of the elements, right, in the equation. Right. So what did, what did, what, what you just, what you've described uh, creates a really um, uh, interesting situation, right? So, like, there is, on the one hand, yes, like, could you talk about sort of like semantic shifts and you know like there's some um, new effects of and differently um, articulated um, um, sort of or relocated or reshuffled sort of um, 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 art, um, artifacts? Sure, right. That could pr that could produce something unexpected, and you know Derrida spent the whole life uh, mm -hmm. writing about that, right? But what it also creates is this fundamental dependency on the already existing lexicon. <coughs> Right, so uh, you are not, if you privilege this kind of reshuffling, this rearrangement, right, so like this kind of, you know, um, discourse of Ikebana of sorts, right, working with the same five names and the same like 10 texts, you're not going to go too far, right? That's why, sort of, you know, for me, the avant garde and futurists um, are, so, um, um, are so interesting precisely because their point is like, I, I, I'm just editing um, a volume and I just read, um, um, worked on a um, big chunk um, of um, texts um, written by Macy Ginsburg. He describes one of the competitions that they had like in the 20s and the one of the rules was you cannot use any old forms for your new projects, period. So the innovation, stylistic, um, structural, compositional, is forced upon you. You cannot sort of substitute the lack of um, uh, original thinking by, you know, exuberant or intricate um, rearranging of the already existing elements. So that's what I'm missing in this kind of parasitic, um, um, or parodic for that matter, sort of um, uh, engagements with culture. And that's what, uh, it was fun for a while. But now, you know, as foremost would say, you know, like the device is kind of getting stale. Mm. We've seen it many times. You so know. you think we need a revolution or not? I, it doesn't have to be a revolution, it has to be new. You know, in that sense, like I'm told totally Chekhovian, you know, like new forms. Where are they? New forms. Like how how many more, I don't know, reiterations of, I don't know, um, three sisters do we need? Yeah. Give me a new play. Uh, these days, the Harriman um, writers in residence is the Bulgarian writer Georgi Gospodinov. And he wrote the novel, The Time Shelter, exactly about the, 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 this pandemic of nostalgia. So it's about some kind of um, machine that produces, that produces uh, nostalgically longed uh, spaces, uh, first comfortably for people, and then, then for countries. Each country sort of votes what, what uh, time period would be more nostalgically pleasant right um, and so, so and basically of course it, it places what we saw in Russia into the global context and uh, what we saw with Trump uh, was of the same uh, source of the same desire to escape from from modernity that's too, 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 too bad too dangerous too, too dramatic too stressful etc but what what we see in Russia right now uh, suggests that the most nostalgically longed moment in Russian history is the war. The, the, the war has been, uh, despite all this mantra, anything but the war, the war has been sort of installed into the cultural imagination as the moment of truth, at the moment of existential height, and therefore the war, and, and you, you, we all heard Putin's rhetoric when he says that the, the, the motherland is in danger, endangered by war, but who cares, right? Uh, that, that the war is, is something that, that people want, want to restore nostalgically. And the, that's probably the the end of this uh, nostalgic process, and uh, I, I had uh, sort of um, I didn't accept it at first, but now I'm thinking that that there is there is uh, a good reason to call this situation postmodern fascism, right? Sort of uh, as 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 fascism in, in the 30s uh, is is the uh, dead end of certain directions within, within modernism and modernity, right? So, so we see it as the dead end of postmodernity. But uh, what are you saying? You're saying, okay, let's, let's forget about all this um, 
that ends right and return to to the initial sort of impulse of modernity make make it new right mm -hmm. make it uh, new forms make it different so so what do you see in in avant-garde well, well, with which you work so closely for how many years uh, you already published three volumes of anthology and they know that you're doing the fourth that is actually two volumes and so so the collected works of uh, theories from from Russian the cradle of Russian avant-garde is growing thanks to you so so what what are the main lessons there just just making things new it's, it's too broad well it's making um, art um, and literature relevant for your daily life not only as a kind of an ideological veneer but also you know Arvatov keeps saying like sort of, you know art has to be uh, an organizer of people's kind of daily activity, right? So that's kind of the main point of it. So he said, like, well, look like theater should give us some models of um, proper behaving, like um, not only kind of, you know, like manners and whatnot, but also like the basic ones, what to do with my body. We don't know how, kind of, you know, to, to, to possess our body, sort of how to control our body properly. And then just like kind of one like, basic example, that's that was the point at the time, you know, you get a lot of people who just came from villages um, and without not necessarily, uh, not necessarily having sort of skills of you know um, body techniques um, as we call it in anthro right so for me this <coughs> kind of link between um, the um, the aesthetic concerns and the social concerns is um, interesting about avant-garde uh, where the social concerns would not be reduced entirely to political or aesthetic critique so and that's what we tend to have now right so politically relevant art now is mostly an art that is, as you mentioned, that is an oppositional art. Uh, we, we are meeting, uh, we're having this conversation right before the beginning of our fourth Shklovsky Symposium that will be dedicated to the reading of uh, one book by Shklovsky, as we did three times before. Uh, and I don't want to steal, steal the thunder from the symposium, but can you say just, just one word, why Shklovsky? Why, why, why Shklovsky became the focus of four conferences already? Well, partly it's the same attempt, sort of like to do what um, uh, Tanya said, namely, uh, can we rearrange the already existing legacy in a way that. So it is a nostalgia, but for the avant garde. Right, but in a way that looks unfamiliar, it's one thing. But um, another one is, can we, can we sort of admit that we overlooked key things that have been sitting there waiting for us and sort of we just didn't pay attention to it precisely because you know every generation reads your you know Leo Tolstoy whoever uh, Gramsci uh, in a different way and I think Shklovsky has actually a lot to deliver like again like so we had a sort of a brief discussion about that but look look how productive Shklovsky could be today he is such a great uh, defender of the significance and the importance of the detail of a shard of a piece of something. And his point is like, you don't need um, um, uh, an elaborate framework. You don't need sort of a whole picture. You don't need this kind of systemic thinking. Relying on the detail could take you really far. And he goes on and on explaining how detail could become a whole, right? How it can grow into that. Try to start from a detail, or sort of try to start from a piece and see where it takes you. And I think, like, sort of, like, it's, it's, is it seminal? I don't know, but, like, sort of, you it's know. It's a good advice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that, that's why, sort of, his investment in the idea of metonymy, you know, and you move them. You don't make the certain arm you know, jumps and leaves, but sort of, like, you move gradually up to something that may take you somewhere, so. Let's finish on this optimistic <laughs> note. Yeah. Thank you so much yeah. for yeah. being our first guest, and thank you, Mark.